Let me uh, just start by asking a question. How many people in this room either work or run an oil company? That's interesting. So there's lots of advisors. So I realise that I'm sitting here as, as somebody who's done it. And uh, one of the challenges is, is reducing some of these problems to scale. So I want to give you a perspective of having worked in the oil and gas industry for 31 years. Um, part of that was working for BP, a significant part. And I worked both in the upstream and also in the downstream. I then moved into advising uh, financial and investment companies, which was a very interesting perspective indeed. And then, of course, I took over as a group chief executive of Dana Petroleum for, for three great years. What I want to do is focus on what's changing, but also why we need to change. And none of us have rehearsed any of these slides before. What I think you'll see is some significant similarities. So let me start um, by talking about change. So I think the first thing to do is recognise the industry is changing. So national oil companies are competing and expanding overseas into areas that were used to be the preserve of international oil companies. Oil and gas companies, uh, the service sector, is offering services that used to be done by the IOCs. And the hydrocarbon resources are getting smaller in terms of access by IOCs, and that's creating an increasing risk. Now, if you look at the two perspectives of national oil companies and international oil companies, then IOCs should worry about production growth, reserves replacement, and, as we've heard this morning, delivering to the shareholder in terms of really stock appreciation and earnings growth. The interesting thing is if you ask a national oil company what they're interested in, and it isn't those in particular, it is about energy security. It is about growing capability and particularly inward social investment. So the dynamics of that industry is changing. I think the second dimension is this whole issue of basin maturity, which we've talked about this morning. And I would say it's, it's dependent on two things. There's the technical risks, which are about whether you take something which is a resource translated in reserve and then actually add it to your balance sheet. The second piece is the risk that Peter was talking about, the political risks, the strategic risks, the operational risks and the financial risks, which fundamentally, right at the beginning of the exploration process, drive rates of return. And it's those two things. So the moment you start on exploration, you've effectively baked in a lot of those parameters. Now, I think we need to recognise that not all international oil companies are created equal and that having a vibrant oil and gas sector is actually one of the range of things that makes the oil and gas sector different. And so you have different scales of company and they work with different sizes of oil and gas uh, service sector companies from tier one, the big players, all the way down to the small players. Now, I've spent a lot of my career working for a super major all the way from frontline, subsurface, all the way up to the executive office. Um, but I actually want to focus on medium-sized international oil companies. But my comments actually also apply, I think, to the majors and super majors. And I think the way particularly that the small to medium-sized companies address the issue of risk and investment will depend on business models. But there are some underlying trends which I think are quite concerning. And these companies are vital to the sector and their increasing preeminence, particularly in certain basins, usually signals the fact that the basin is becoming mature as the super majors and the majors exit. Now, as a result of NOC movements, these companies are shifting their attention away from mature areas actually into frontiers and the risks are going up. And so... Are the investment risks increasing? And I believe they are. So what I want to do is I want to look at the sector from four very different things. One of the things that I find uh, is important to do is reduce the problem to scale. So I want to talk about four Cs. Uh, and these themes have come up this morning. If anybody was expecting me to talk about expiration common process, I'm not going to talk about it, and I'd be happy to. But I think it gets down to four basic things. Capability, which is all about accessing the skills and talent that allows you to explore, to develop, to produce, to put into markets and to finance fundamentally what is all about running a business. The second one, I think, is about cash, the ability to access cash in a variety of forms, 
to sustain the business, but at the same time meeting the expectations of shareholders. The third thing is about competitive advantage. It's about those unique attributes that give one company actually sway over another in exploiting, developing, and producing resources and reserves. And it's what other co-venturers should be looking at in terms of what does that company bring to the table. And then you wrap that all together and ask the question, it's all about communication. I do believe, having observed over the last six years working largely in the small to medium-sized sector, that one of the biggest issues we have, both with shareholders and with employees, is getting very focused about what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, and are we making any money? So let me move on to the first element. So the slide here is a slide where the, the vertical axis is ba basically the increasing diversity of skills and capability with scale, and the horizontal axis is the range of activities. So we're going to go basically from exploration-only players all the way up to the super majors, and I've put the national companies in a different place because I think they are different and they do tend to operate in very different ways, and I do that from a perspective of having worked for one. So the slide illustrates really diversity from the exploration players, and they tend to be dominated by small GMD teams. They work on focus-specific geographical locations, and we then move up into the mid-caps, which have larger workforces, and they blend really in-house resources and external consultants. And their strategies tend to focus on key regions or specific elements of the exploration to production value chain. So they may focus on developments into production or exploration and development. And then, of course, we go to the global super majors. Now, these really do push the frontiers, as we've talked about, in terms of scale, materiality, technical challenge, and also they, own, they maintain their own specialist and in-house operational and R&D capability. Now, the reality is, is that from the 1980s onwards, there have been successive phases of restructuring. And what that's done is shift the skills from, really, the larger oil companies to progressively smaller and smaller companies, and also out into the oil and gas service sector. What that's done is created some very interesting challenges for training and development at very different scales. So no longer do you have large companies developing training programs for large numbers of people. And it's down to, actually, conferences like this where people actually garner ideas about what to do next. Now, that growing skills shortage and also some changes that have been going on in employment terms combined with a focus on cost rather than value, I think are driving the next level of attrition in the industry. So it wouldn't be surprising for me to say then that the progressive dilution of skills and capability, I believe, is one of the causes of underperformance. So let's start with exploration. So exploration should be about value, not volumes. It requires a rigorous understanding and analysis of the full range of risks, and I, just, I don't mean just technical risk. And how does this apply to exploration-only players or mid-caps whose challenge is to grow and deliver shareholder value whilst operating with narrow portfolio boundaries and greater financial constraints, and actually where the market rewards minimising and variableizing costs to manage peaks and troughs? So the challenge for these companies is no different than their larger counterparts. The risks are the same. In fact, they may be even bigger. And that's to manage risk on a holistic basis from new country entry and expiration through to development, through to production, whether you are in a mature basin or whether you're in the frontiers. And for small and medium-sized companies, are those risks increasing as they rely heavily on management teams backed by small in-house resources overseeing the work of outsourced providers? I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Now, I do believe the model works in mature basins where they act in a non-operated capacity, where companies can secure expertise based on a local track record of working in a basin, and frankly, the basic groundwork has been done. But one company's mature basin is another company's frontier if they've never worked there before. Surely the model starts to break down and the risks inevitably increase when companies seek to explore new frontiers where local knowledge is very limited. And success is only likely where the right capacity and capability is brought to bear on each stage of the exploration process. 
from basin access, which is all about understanding reward and risk, to building the portfolio inventory based on regional understanding, to the final stages of lead and prospect definition that allows a company to exercise what many would call quality through choice. And yet the availability of skills and talent in that market is diminishing as employees in progressively earlier stages of their career opt to become day raters rather than following con conventional development paths within larger organisations to build experience and demonstrate what good looks like. So we have a challenge. The outcome is a progressive dilution of capability at a time when IOCs really need that expertise. So I think we have to be honest with ourselves and ask a fundamental question. Are we matching the skills and rigour required to deliver exploration success against increasing risk? And are we communicating those risks correctly so that we can assure the right cost versus value trade-off in terms of capability and capacity? Now, interestingly, if we then shift to the world of developments, then, of course, that problem is amplified further. And the objective of developments is to create future value, delivering projects which are efficient in capital investment and sustain long-term operations to grow the asset base. That's the whole point. But small to medium-sized companies can rarely justify large in-house project teams, and so there is an, a tendency to extend this outsource model further with development projects managed by a limited number of employees backed by significant third-party resources. And those resources then focus on not just front-end engineering, often uh, conceptual engineering, in some cases, detailed engineering design of billion-dollar projects. So whilst the model may work for minor facilities and specific elements of major projects, have we got the balance right of skills when companies move into major developments which were once the preserve of the super majors who work with tier one and tier two oil and gas service companies. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard the reasons why projects aren't on time, aren't on budget, and don't deliver production outcomes, but let's just revisit for a second. So it's a well-known fact that delays and cost overruns in major projects generally relates to the degree of rigor that went into early concept selection. It's called front-end loading. Whether the full technical and commercial uncertainties are considered in final engineering design, or what tends to happen is a more simplified approach is applied to collapse uncertainties down into a single set of parameters. Now, I would suggest that given the levels of capital investment in these projects, that oversight of major projects really requires a heightened level of project governance rather than conventional project management. As uh, Chris said this morning, the variation order is not a victimless uh, challenge. So I think part of the performance issues relates to the type and balance of in-house versus external expertise, how uncertainties are translated into detail engineering design, and the degree of rigour that is actually applied. In addition, I think cost, schedule and production are inextricably linked. And I have been in many meetings when somebody has said we need to cut the costs of the project. Well, what's the impact of that? Production will change, the schedule will change, and vice versa. So, and finally on to production, and Peter talks about this um, uh, at length, which is the business of optimising the current value on the balance sheet. Now, the realities are, is that if you are in the business of development and production, both uh, ageing facilities and new facilities, that there's a whole range of reasons why that production may not hit the target. It may be the changing schedules of your development startups. It may be production rephasing because of a change in investment phasing. It may be because of downtime of facilities or first year oper operability issues. And, but it also may be because of turnarounds on infrastructure that you have absolutely no control over. And as Peter said earlier, joint ventures work because it's about mutual advantage. The challenge with operated and non-operated businesses is that you don't have an awful lot of control. So the use of production guidance rather than production targets is actually one step in the right direction, I think, in terms of signalling to the community, particularly the investment community, all about performance. So I would say to many people in this room 
that when you judge a company's performance, take account of whether they act as operator or they're simply a co-venturer. Whether the facilities are managed by the company or by outsource vendors. Because the critical factor in ensuring success in all of this is about communication and increasing transparency of information about performance. So I want to move on to the next uh, piece of the puzzle, cash. Now, it forms the, uh, the second driver, I think, of, of performance. And the first slide that you'll see up here is the cost of doing business. I'm also going to talk about the sources of cash and what that means in terms of where the shareholder fits in. So this is a very simple plot. Uh, basically, it shows well costs. It shows uh, rig rates, development costs, and cycle times at the bottom, expiration and then development. And of course, as you go right, the costs increase, the cycle times, the working capital that gets invested in the business, of course, increases. And you see progressively larger and larger facilities. And frankly, you're pushing the technology envelope the further you go to the right. Now, for small to medium-sized companies, mature basins offer lower risk profiles than frontiers, but the prizes are considerably smaller. So that's the top end of this slide, the, the, the left-hand side. Expiration is largely infrastructure-led, and the purpose is to stem decline, and usually through field extensions and satellite tiebacks. When you do get major projects in these settings, they usually are when it's more efficient to deplete multiple discoveries through a single development option linked back to existing either floating or fixed infrastructure. But the big step change in the company value clearly comes from success in frontiers, which is offers the potential for larger hydrocarbon volumes, step changes in returns, but also greater risks. But you'll also see that the time frames that you lock in working capital increases as you go right. Now the challenge is that with NOCs competing, there's a need for all companies to grow shareholder value, and that is driving them more and more to the frontiers, where they may not have the capability or the capacity to develop a deep understanding of risks, and where a cost structure, as illustrated in the slide, is significantly greater than they had in the past. Now, in these cases, the challenge is to manage investment in a variety of ways. But there is a shift, and it is from onshore to offshore, into deeper and deeper water, and even in onshore, to shift to mangrove land interfaces, the Arctic, and other, frankly, inhospitable places where the costs are not dissimilar, frankly, to ultra-deep water. So what do the, what do the companies do? The bold companies will use a first mover advantage by committing to an operatorship and high equities in basin entry, and there is a hope that they will secure other partners for later farmings after initial success, but effectively they are betting the company. The more conservative may pursue a non-operated investor approach, and they'll selectively farm in at lower equities, and they'll spread the risk across a range of portfolios. But with $200 million gross cost wells, you don't get an awful lot of wells for $200 million if that's your budget. You're getting even less if your exploration budget is $50 million. Now, this gets back to the whole issue of where does the cash come from? And it will lead into the question around where are our shareholders gaining value? So this slide, again, the vertical axis here, is all about access to different sources of cash. And it does vary by the maturity of which part of the business you're in. And then, of course, on the horizontal, of course, is expiration to, to, to uh, production value chain. And if you look at the bullet point uh, points on the right-hand side, these are usually how companies make money. So often, expiration companies will want to create some form of liquidity event. They find something, and they know they cannot take it into development, and so they wish to sell. And you've seen that with things like Cove Energy. Um, you then get into the mid-cap area, which is an interesting place because they're on that decision point of whether they move forward with developments or whether they monetize or they get big enough to have sufficient scale to be taken over. And so you have the liquidity event, like the classic purchase, or <coughs> you focus on value creation in a limited number of areas rather than distributing across everywhere. So when exploration success happens, 
you create additional funding. And the challenge is then to borrow or issue new equity to support development. Now, if you happen to be a shareholder, when you issue new equity, that is dilution. That's not a clever thing. Or they seek to monetize the asset by some form of sale, either the asset or the whole of the company. So growth from small to medium cap companies generally follows this simple path. They find something. They then decide, usually because of guidance, that they need to have more assets on the balance sheet, those that produce cash. And so they buy things and acquire things. And what's interesting is that by doing so, they go to banks to borrow. And they'll use their operating cash from their producing assets to fund organic growth, and they'll use their bank lending to acquire. The problem is, is that the level as you grow of working capital increases dramatically and increases certainly as you go from left to right in the diagram. So for companies embarking on developments, the next logical step is borrow the funds on major projects on the basis of future cash flow. But by doing so, what they do is reduce the financial flexibility and the amount of distributable funds available to the shareholder. And that's why you see many mid-caps with extremely high degrees of leverage. And that is why, because that money is locked in and, frankly, has to be paid out before you pay the shareholder, that you get into this interesting tension with shareholders. Now, this usually occurs, that development success or that exploration success usually occurs at a time when the shareholders turn around and say, it's time to make money. And very rapidly after that, it's time to pay some back. And rather than accede to management's request, really, to, to grow debt and commit to cash dividends sometime in the future, which brings us then on to the issue of meeting shareholder returns. So we get into this vicious cycle. So here's a slide, which is like a business machine. The left-hand side is basically the asset sources of cash, so things that are being churned off by the business. The right-hand side is the decisions that management makes in terms of how you use cash. Now, what's happening is, of course, that, as everybody has seen, the market doesn't regard performance in the EMP sector as particularly good. So what we've had is a set of recent announcements that about improving returns to the shareholder. And what people are doing is going back to those well-honed uh, levels of expertise of the 1980s, 90s, and 90s, where interventions reset the clock, but they don't actually address the underlying issues of the business which is the increasing risk and the demand for capability and business rigour. Uh, many of you will know a lot of the interventions. So, for example, in implementing share buybacks, it's interesting that rarely does that actually increase long-term shareholder value. Reducing cash costs through improved capital discipline and cost discipline. And I'm always amazed by the, the fact that analysts don't turn around and say, well, sure, you should be doing that anyway. Um, consolidating portfolios and reinvesting sale proceeds acquiring and uh, merging companies to deliver cost synergies, as they're called. There's a whole range of things that people can do, including changing the structures of contracts. So, for example, there is a shift, and it was raised earlier as a question, from equity and royalty-based contracts with governments actually to PSAs and fee-based contracts. By definition, the rate of return must go down because PSAs are bounded by contractual conditions. So, therefore, the rate of return must come down. And if you don't believe me, compare the value of a barrel of oil from the Republic of Iraq with the independent um, government of Kurdistan. The difference is basically $7.5 a barrel, just because one's a fee-based contract and one is a PSA. And then, of course, and finally, there is the old technique called restructuring, reducing headcount, with a loss of key skills and capabilities. So what do we do? We then dilute the capability of the business. So I would suggest, and this is where I have not conferred with any of my colleagues, I think it's time to change the way we operate. And I say this from having done it. It is about treating oil and gas businesses as manufacturing businesses. I promise you I did not confer with anybody. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, I think there's a couple of things. The first thing is the structure of debt and liquidity. So it's about getting greater clarity on a company's long-term financial requirements. 
And that means understanding the sources and uses of cash over five to ten year periods rather than just annual cycles. It's very easy in a company that is effectively exploring and, and frankly buying to contain everything within a year. The moment you move into the world of developments and production, you're in the world of five to ten years. And that's a reality. Now, to do that means you have to get very clear about capital structure and particularly debt policy. Because having debt's great, but there is a point at which you have basically locked in the potential of paying your shareholders. Now, I know a number of analysts in the room and financial commentators will probably say you've got to recognise that there's increased vulnerability if you get the capital structure right, but that's, that's true. I think the second one is about how you operate. Um, in 1996, I was, was sent off to business school and I visited a car manufacturing, manufacturing plant called Toyota. And I was stunned by the way the place was run. In Toyota, they clearly were running a lean operation. And boy, were they good at that. And boy, did they spend our money on great capability. And what was interesting was the rigor in which people thought about the process. And that's the balanced and desire for individual entrepreneurial flair of the explorer with the need for rigor, consistency and standardization characteristic of the low margin manufacturing operations. We do not in our business do supply chain management, we do logistics. When we do maintenance we tend to do it in an ad hoc basis rather than campaign maintenance. You would never survive in a manufacturing business if you ran it that way. So taking on the operating discipline of world-class manufacturing companies will, I'm convinced, and I've seen it done because we've done it, drive cost efficiency, apply technology, apply technology, and share best practice because it's amazing when everybody knows how to do something. Now let me give you a simple analogy since it's the World Cup. The game of football has a bunch of standards, the size of the ball, the rules of the game, the size of the goalposts, the fact that there's a referee and two linesmen. Nobody would question that those boundaries exist. Those are the rules of the game. What makes the difference is how you play on the pitch. And I would suggest that the same rules apply to ENP. So if the management of risk is about applying very the best technical and commercial skills to exploration and production, we need to get the balance right in technical rigor and consistency on one hand and innovation and reward based on team versus individual results on the other. Now, why is that important? I think it's all about competitive advantage. And I say this because the world has changed. It is a changing landscape with NOCs becoming more prominent wherever we go. And that means that we have to ensure the scale and diversity of in-house core skills aligns with what we're trying to do. And I know there are very, very good people out there in a range of different settings, but there are massive differences in the way those skills are applied in terms of capability and process. I cannot remember how many times somebody, usually uh, another CEO, walked into my room and said, I've got this really good prospect. And I say, tell me four things. How big is it? How are you going to develop it? How are you going to get it to market? And what's it going to cost? And they look at me and say, why would you want to know those things? That is the difference between saying it's all about value versus it's about the volumes. So I think there's a piece around ensuring the scale and diversity of in-house core skills. I think there's a second thing, which is removing this volatility in the business cycle. Because as Peter talked about, a lot of the things that we see, particularly in production operations and also in developments, are about sticking to the plot. Doing the same things over and over again and doing them really well. And it is about common rules of the game. Now, I have no doubt in frontier areas, pushing the envelope in frontiers is very important. But we have to recognize the demands on cash and capability through the EMP cycle. And I do think we have to reevaluate the capital structure of companies and their debt policies if the, if the shareholder is truly going to benefit. Now, bear in mind that people watch other people. And if you are good at what you do, people will join you. Now, this gets to the final point, which is about communication. I, um, I think there is an issue about how we communicate to the markets. This focus on quarter on quarter is important, but actually our business is about long-term plans. I also think it's important to explain what's going on. 
because there are perfectly rational reasons why performance is the way it is, and explaining some of those uncertainties is really important. So I come back to, if you want to have competitive advantage, you have to do things with rigour. You do have to follow process. You will get the outcomes you, you need. And I think I'm going to flip through to the final slide and say, in my view, it's down to four things. It's about capability, the people. It's about whether you can raise the cash. It's about whether you can create competitive advantage. And it's about communicating both to the stakeholders and your employees, what is it you're trying to do? Because I think if you ignore them, you do so at your peril. Because success will not be an outcome. Thank you.